one. Hey guys, how's it going? It's me, Josh Holder, owner and founder of The Bio Dude. Today, I am doing a build video with Robin. You guys know Robin from the past video, Reptile Report, THG Heat, and Pro Exotics. And we, after the much requested video, are going to show you guys how to set up a crocodile skink bioactive enclosure. And I'm really excited about that. So behind us, we got some stuff, we got some goodies. In between our two palms, we have a 24-18-18 Exoterra, which could comfortably house a pair. Uh, my expectation with this is it's going to have a drainage layer with my terraflora substrate, and then we're going to provide lots of different areas for them to go in and be their little secretive selves. Um, something that I've always dealt with this species is uh, when I bred them back in 2004 is they're not out a lot. Do you agree with that? They are pretty secretive, yeah. Um, but when you do get to see them interact, yep. it's an amazing lizard. Yep. Uh, they've not been around forever. I remember working in the 90s with them when they first started coming in. Yep. Very difficult for us to understand how to keep them. Yep. But now we understand better how to set them up, husbandry and such, and I'm super excited yeah, uh, and to get this little dude set up. And it's interesting because there's multiple locales, if I'm not mistaken, they are from New, uh, New Guinea. Um, and then I think some of the other islands surrounding New Guinea to help differentiate some of the locales, if I'm not mistaken. Okay, let's grab it. Let's show our people what, uh, what, what, what we got working with today. So, I actually picked up this captive bred baby from the Dallas-Fort Worth Reptarium at the NARDC show. I'm really, really excited. Yeah. To you take a look? Yeah, yeah, let's get him out. Let, let's show our people. So, it's really interesting to find a captive bred one because they're almost always imported. So he has been in this container for a couple days. I mean, look at this. Look at this adorable little creature. So as we get a little bit older, they do have a couple ways for sexual dimorphism. So the one way that I was always taught and when I was younger, the males will develop a small belly button, um, which is gonna be about right here above my thumb. But the biggest thing that they, that they talk about is they have individual scent glands that are in their feet that are called vocal pores, I believe. Um, and they it's noted that with this species that they use those pores to potentially to in some way, shape or form, I, I don't want to say marking their territory, but to let people know that, hey, you know, this is what I smell like, this is what I am. Females come holler at me type of thing, right? To, to pick up chicks. Yeah, yes, yeah. that's what it's for. I mean, look at look at this. It's like a little mini dragon. Yeah, it is. So, Robin, tell me your experience with this. Have you, have you, have you so you kept these in the 90s when we, you were rocking We did, yeah, yeah. Exotics? Last century, we worked with some of these. Again, it was really early on, so not a lot of uh, information was known about them. Yep. Uh, husbandry was really unknown. Uh, so they were really difficult to keep, and nobody was breeding them at the time. Like I said, they were all uh, wild-caught animals, which uh, made it real tough as well. Um, I'm really excited to know that people are captive breeding these now, because yep. it, while it is a secretive uh, species, it's just a fascinating lizard. Yeah, and then you see the babies, and you see how adorable they are, and you're like, how could I not want to work with this? So, awesome. I vote we get building. What do you think about that? I'm ready. So, all right. All right, so what I'm going to do, so the first thing, since we are using a drainage layer, is we're going to put down the drainage layer. Now, there's a bunch of different types of drainage layers you can use. You can use Lika. Use your clay balls. You can use rocks that you get from any of like a, like a hardware store, like Lowe's or Home Depot. Or you could also use the BioDudes Hydro Grow. So the Hydro Grow is similar to the same drainage that they use for baseball fields. Um, it is made out of cooked calcium clay. And it's 100% natural. Uh, what I really like about the Hydro Grow is that it aerates top to bottom, like every drainage layer should. But it doesn't create that uneven top surface like your clay balls can. And when I say the uneven surface, so what that can cause is sometimes if you have really active animals, they can disrupt the screen because it's uneven and then the substrate can get mixed up. And then if that happens, you have your drainage water getting in mixed up with your sub substrate, which can cause bad bacteria build up and all that stuff. And we don't want that. Nobody want wants that. that. Nobody wants that, especially when it smells like methane. So, here you go, dude. Let's start rocking and rolling. I'm gonna grab the trash can. So we're gonna do, I would say about a two inch layer of drainage. 
And the crocodile skinks are like to be, you know, kept pretty humid. So they like to be on the forest, uh, right on the forest floor. <laughs> where there's a lot of, uh, where there's a lot of biodegradables on the ground. So a lot of rotting wood, a lot of different, uh, different types of bugs, isopods, worms that they can readily eat and catch as they please. So it kind of yet again reinforces why they are a little bit more of the secretive species because they can get in their little den and everything is at some point going to come right to them. How many bags do you think we should use? Rock and roll with three. And okay. let's see, uh, let's see where we end. Well, let's see where we end up with the two, and then let's spread it out. Since since they like to have between a seventy-five percent and between seventy-five and ninety percent humidity, the ninety percent being the high end during the day, with the seventy to seventy-five percent being the low end, uh, it's recommended to at least have a two-inch substrate layer, and then. Uh, it's a little bit short. It's a little bit short. I'd rock and roll one more bag. Okay. There we go. It's partially it's, open. It's partially <laughs> open. It's okay. Save the pebbles. All right, all right. Nice. So since we're, you know, evenly distributing the top layer, you know, we're going to uh, still put the screen on top just to be sure because you know, if we do end up getting a pair at some point, the girls are going to want to dig. And then once they dig, you want to make sure that they can't dig into the drainage layer. As far as maintenance is concerned, we want to make sure the water level never goes past the drainage layer and that we're always, you know, uh, pretty adamant about not allowing that to happen. So let's say... I made a J for Josh. I, I see that. It should have been B for BioDujo. Oh, uh, uh, no, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Branding. <laughs> yep, that's right. So we got the nice level of the of, of the drainage layer i like this so the next thing that we're going to do is put it on is put on the screen let's rock and roll with the screen while you're doing that i'm going to get this substrate open and moisturized so screen like i said screens are not entirely needed with my hydro grow but i include it just to be on the side of, you know, safety. Again, just to keep everything nice and separate. Yes, to keep everything nice and You'll separate. You'll start to get a blend. Yep, yep. So contaminants going different layers. Exactly. So the last thing that we want, dude, is to have stuff mix up, especially because we know that if we get girls, they're going to dig. You know, even he's going to dig when he wants to create his little burrows and funnels and things like that. Sure. So what we got rocking and rolling right now, we got the flora in this bag, and I dumped a lot of water in here. So now what I'm doing is, this is how I, you know, get the substrates rocking and rolling and try not to spill all over my rug. There we go. So pretty decent spread here. So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna take this, my terra floor here and I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna dump it in. Well I'm gonna dump in majority of this. Okay. Now let's see, let's see how this how this looks here. Alright. So um, what I'm also gonna do is kind of push down right here at the end. See how I'm pushing down the tribe just to make sure that you know, that my screen is set up exactly the way I want it to. So as of right now, we only have about an inch of soil in here. That's not gonna do it for me. Um, as far as I'm concerned, that's not enough. You wanna add more? Yeah, go ahead and add, I would say half of this bag, and then let's see the other half. And let's see where we end up. And you can see now how the bottom is significantly, has a little bit more moisture content. And that's gonna be helpful for when we go to mix everything up. So the one thing that we want to keep keep in mind here is when we're building these types of terrariums for these lizards is obviously a good depth of substrate is really important. Sure. You know, but but at the end of the day, we want to make sure that we're not cutting into a ton of space. So this amount of substrate to me, this is absolutely perfect for for what it is of what we're trying to do with these guys. So now we have our base layer of substrate down. So what makes the flora like very similar? Um, you know, it function, function wise to like your ABG mix and other things like that, is that it's going to help, you know, uh, keep your different layers wet while at the same time 
same time aerating from top to bottom. That's the most important part with terrariums is, you know, which I'm sure that you've seen before, is making sure that we're not allowing bad bacteria or a really acidic soil to constantly just absorb water, absorb water, and then it ends up turning into almost a poison. A poison. Substrate. A little sewer? A little sewer, that's exactly yep. right. So let's add some moss in here. So Robin, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna dump a little bit of water in here because I decided to use all the water from the thing and we're gonna dump this in here. Do you mind holding this for me? I don't mind at all. All right. Well, okay, his little bit of water is actually a lot of water. <laughs> you guys remember the Fear of Dragon video? Everyone's like, I'm gonna use a little bit of water and I dump them with a gallon. But this is the, I love doing it this way because this makes it a little bit easier. Clean up is still, you know, a thing, but. And then what we're gonna do is we're gonna take that entire bag and we're gonna dump the entire thing and we're gonna thoroughly mix it with all the substrate. So. What do you think the benefit of this is besides raising the humidity? Do you think it does anything else? I'm sure it does something else. It does. What does it do, John? So, so essentially what this is going to do is your microbial processes from the Bioshot as well as your springtails and isopods are slowly going to break this down and as they break it down it's going to create organic nutrition for your soil. Uh, which is going to continually re-benefit and rejuvenate your substrate. And it can also obviously help raise humidity, help with plant health, and uh, as well as help help with those tunnels and burrows and things or the dens that your crocodile skink is inevitably going to make. You know, back in the old days, we used to have to go and raid garden nurseries, Home Depot type spots yep. to get a nice, uh, like a sphagnum type product. Yep. yep. Um, it's awesome that you have your own branded product. Oh, now. I know. Yeah. That I'm way you can too. control you can control the quality of the product, yep. uh, the density of it, the long fiber aspect. Yep. And sometimes you can get the cheaper stuff that'll have the spill, like the, the priors in it. Like there's like they're start they're like really sharp little pieces of like seed that will just beat the crap out of your fingers. Yeah. And like or like sometimes you get a lot of sticks and stuff. But this stuff out in out of New Zealand really does the trick. Um, but it's more along the lines of it really helps with well, you know, when, when I always tell my viewers, when it comes to husbandry, there's a couple things that we really want to keep an eye out for. And that's shedding, respiration, and hydration. So we want to spread this evenly across the whole side? So what I like to do is spread it evenly across the top and then thoroughly mix it together top to bottom into the soil. Okay. And as you can see, so Robin's creating little air, little air pockets as well to help with again, the aeration of the soil and to help provide that organic nutrition that we need. Yeah, good. All right, we ready to stir it up? Yeah, let's stir it up. Okay. So what I like to do is I'm just gonna go right like this. And it looks like a lot clunkier now, doesn't it? And that's just because... It's really fluffing up. It looks like you're making a pasta dough. A little bit. Need it. Yes. Need it like a pizza. And Kevin from the office. Not like a pizza. <laughs> cool. I dig it. So, what I like to do next is add the leaf litter. So, some people like to do this step last, but I like to mix the leaves into the soil for the exact same principle as the sphag moss. Which, let's, okay. see, let's see if you were listening, what did the sphag moss do? Now, what is the, 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 are the leaves going to do? Continue to, to contribute to the, that whole biomass, yep. to be, contribute to the breakdown process, yep. and contribute to bacterial control. Yes. Way to go, dude. Yeah. All right. All right. Look at me. Yep. So those are mag, these are uh, mag, magnolia leaves. These are like honestly one of the most popular because of their surface area it gives a lot of surface area for the bugs to crawl on yeah as well as uh, they take a little bit longer to uh break down so you can break them up you can do it ho however you like and i label them all as biodegradable so try to make it easy for people to understand you know what it is that we're doing and they're pretty dry they crack mm -hmm. and, yep. and come apart pretty yeah easy, so right? it's nice so sometimes i'll take like a big old leaf just like this and i'll just 
and I'll turn it into the dust like this, and I'll mix that into the soil with my isopod cultures. And A, again, it creates those little tiny microbial hot spots that they just lose their minds over, especially your larger species, which I'll show you guys in just a middle, in a little bit. Okay, so what are we gonna do with this? Let's mix it, so I'll, I'm gonna mix it right like this. Just crunch it up, break it down. I like to crunch them up and break them down, but some like there are other people that are like, don't break the magnolia, it's too beautiful of a leaf, leave it in its full form. Um, I'm literally just going right like this. So we got some that are mixed. Yeah, you have some big ones, you have some small ones. Now, yep. a, a lizard like uh, the Triblonotus, the red-eyed croc lizard, yes. they are very thigmatrophic. I like that. Which means that they like to have small, uh, tight areas yes. to get into. Yes. A lot of monitor lizards uh, like that, uh, yeah. gecko like species the, uh, like that. Like the tight cork tubes and stuff. Yeah, yep. so the tighter the hiding spot or the tighter the yep. crevice, the more secure they can feel. And you know why that goes back to uh, uh, in their life? Is because a lot of predation comes from above. That makes sense. Like birds and, makes and, sense. and predators come from above and, and pick them off the, yep. off the ground. Yep. And so if they're covered under uh, a material, under a rock, under leaf litter, yep. Uh, in, in a crevice, they they can feel safer, and they feel safest when they get that thigmatrophic effect, where they can feel the uh, the protection over their back. And you know what? I think we're going to be able to do that pretty well with the cork flies. Yeah, well, yeah. You do I mean, with the corks. Okay. You, it, you can do it in a co combination of ways. Okay. So give still give them access to different levels of gradients of temperature and moisture and everything else. It's all about choices, right? Yeah. Give the animals the best choices oh, yes, yes. so that they can take advantage of, of the habitat you set up I always and get them comfortable viewers. and low stress. Yep. Options, options, options. Yes. Yeah. So, yeah, always choices. So the next thing, let's go ahead and let's add in the bio shot and the bugs. So first, Let's let, let's show our viewers what the the tropical springtails. So I showed you my master culture room with these things. Yep. Um, so this culture was made on 122. So it's been rocking and rolling now for about four weeks. There's a lot of bugs in here. So all we're gonna do is just dump this culture right in here. So the springtails just dump the whole thing in. So the springtails, what they're gonna do is just like any other uh, environment, they're gonna breed within the system create a sustainable population while helping with the breakdown of organic. Exactly. Sounds good to me. Yep, and then, so these are one of the newer types of isos that I got in, the powder white isopods. And again, I told you guys where I get my isopods from, that's why we're using EcoWorth right now. So these um, are your larger, these are your larger ones and these are the white variety. So I'm actually testing these out in here with this slightly more humid biome just to see how they do. It's a little carrot. It is a little carrot. So I put uh, he puts them in there so that way they can stay happy and healthy during their time here. Can I have the carrot? Yeah, you, you can. Okay, okay, thanks. You're welcome. So, dude, let's dump these critters in here. All right, no All right. carrot. I'm gonna save this for later. <laughs> All right, good day. Okay, next is the bio shot. So a lot of people ask me, bio dude, what is this? So do me a favor, I want you to smell this. Get a zoom in on this face. Okay. Yeah. I mean, that's definitely organic. Yeah, it's very organic. <laughs> but it's not as frightening as you've kind of made it. No, so. no, that was kind of the point. So what this is going to do, think of it as an inoculant for funguses and bacteria while providing an essential 444 and PK ratio given in organic forms. So 444 that's what I thought. is your nitrogen, potassium, and um, N, P, and K, and phosphorus. You know, it kind of smells good. You think that's that, not what I was thinking, but that's you think, I mean, it smells good in a biologically positive way. It doesn't smell I can like understand. it doesn't smell like rotten eggs. It doesn't it smell doesn't, like methane. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't smell like something rotting. Yeah, it, 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 it just it, it smells, smells like organic. Plants. Yeah. It smells like plants. Yeah. So let's go ahead and let's dump in that entire container, and then we're gonna slightly. So when we dump it, just kind of go like this. So that mm -hmm. way, it covers the entire thing. Now you can. If you already put in your leaves, which we did, I highly recommend slightly mixing it together just so that way you get a little bit more surface area out of your bio shot. And then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna take the leaves, kind of just lightly, just, yeah. The, bugs, the bugs are like, what are you doing to me? 
So you can turn it over so that the, the shot actually gets into the substrate. Yes, substrate. Yeah, so regardless of sure. how you dump it in, it's gonna reach its way. It just takes time because it's, it's organic processes. It's gonna take a little bit of time to do it. So now we got our base layer down here. We got our drainage layer, which the water level is gonna get and slowly rise up to here. And once it does, we're gonna drain it. But honestly, with the screen lid on here, with you misting it two to three times a day, to keep that 70 to 90 70 percent humidity with a spike in 90. you know you can also cover up these screens what i like to do exoterra almost made it too good like perfect you can get a normal gallon ziploc bag mm -hmm. and it fits perfectly in here all you have to do is cut it and then sit it right on top it never moves never flies away and it will keep all the humidity right in it's 100 percent clear so it fits perfect after it fits you perfect cut after, it, yes, after you it. cut it but the width the width is oh, what is I yes see. the width. I so see. that way you don't have to sit there and tape it that's a pretty good idea we used yep. to use like tin foil or aluminum foil yep. type of stuff yep yep um, and then what else we got rocking and rolling here and then we have okay. my terra flora with the bio shot spring tails and ice spots which are going to help break down the waste and all that stuff so we've been talking a lot about substrate dude let's get building so the first thing that we're going to want to do is a Let's, let's just have an idea where we want our water dish to be. Because I always first build around the water dish because that has to be easily clean and acceptable. That's right. So I am down for these Bluetooth holes because A, they look like rocks. Two, they're super easy to clean. I make my, I have my employees, when they pull the bowls out, they use a little toothbrush. And it does, it works extremely well to prevent allergy and other nasties from building up at the bottom. And they are made, they are made from resin. So where, where do you want the bowl? That's the first thing. We're gonna have it in an area that's gonna be easy for us to pull, pull and put out. So I'm, I'm thinking maybe one of the front corners. I think corners. that's perfect. Yeah. So it has been noted in the wild that these guys like to soak um, because they do dehydrate pretty quickly. So it's very important that we always make sure that we provide clean water. And let me show you guys a little trick. Since we are insectivores, what I will always do is I will take a small piece of cork like this and I will always leave it in the water bowl like that. So that cork is going that cork piece is always going to float. But if, if your isopods or your crickets get in this water bowl, they mm -hmm. can crawl out and hop right back out without poisoning the like water. Like a little ladder. Like out. a little, yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yeah. And then the crevices. So we have a bunch of different small types of cork flats here. And they, they hooked us up. What do we got? So I wanted to create obviously i want two level i want one level to go to the very bottom just barely above the drainage screen and then and then i was thinking about stacking them to create a multitude level of different tiers of um hides unless you think we should do something different. no again i'm always a fan of uh multiple levels and, and choices okay so i think i want to start with since this is this is the biggest one besides that one I'm gonna, how about we start with this piece and have it be on this side. So in your experience, Robin, with, so what I've been, you know, reading and with my experience when I bred, kept them in high school is I never provided them a heat source um, because they liked it to be cool. So, you know, with them reaching barely wanting to get above 85 or 83 degrees, I never provided supplemental heat unless it was winter time in Pennsylvania which then that time is when I, you know, went out a really small surrounding heat emitter, but I'd really have to up the misting. Which yeah, is, I mean, if, unless your house gets really, really aggressively cold, um, they shouldn't need okay. a, a supplemental heat. Okay, what do you think of this so far? So this, this hide right here goes all the way, all the way down to the back. And it's pretty tight, right like that. And this is gonna hold a crap ton of crap ton of humidity. And then if we put a little layer on there, do you want to add another another level? Another cork on top of that? Yeah. Yeah. I think so. Is that the right technique for breaking cork? That's how I always do it, dude. I got it. Right okay. over the knee. Right. All right. All right. All right. Right over the knee. Here we go. Here we go. Okay. What if we do a kind of, so I did this, because this is another little small snuggly port here. Mm -hmm. I can just imagine it's cute, there are cute little faces sticking out. And then you want a top? Yeah. A top piece? Yep, right like that. As such? Yep. And then maybe do another piece. I'll hold up. 
I got an idea here. So I want to go like this. Do you of think, course, over the next two weeks, you're probably going to modify it. Oh, absolutely. And, it and see and see what's going to be. Do you think yeah. this? Do you think this is too much here on the top, or should we leave it right like this? One, two, three level of hides. Uh, with the other stuff we have going on, I think that's probably a good place to okay. start. Right like this. So, what I what I would kind of envisioning here? Do we got this crazy plant that I've been getting in here at the Bio Dude called Oak Leaf Creeping Fig? This stuff grows like a weed, and it's a beautiful plant. What I think would be pretty awesome is to have this creep onto the cork over the top. So what mm -hmm. are you thinking if we kind of put it, put it right here in the corner? Yeah, in the front corner there? Yeah. Sure. All right, I'm gonna depot it, then do you wanna plant it? Yes, I would love to plant right. it. All right. Dun, dun, dun. Dun, 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 dun. Okay. So we're gonna put it over here. I already see bugs crawling around. How yep. about that? Don't take long, dude. Well, we've been kind of playing God and moving them yeah. around in the way that they probably don't appreciate, but that's okay. They'll, they'll adapt and adjust. Now, my wife is a master gardener, and so she'll watch the video and then she'll critique my planting completely skills? amateur planting skills. Hey, you're doing pretty good right now. Thank and, you. And you're even put, put, putting pressure around the bottom of the root base to make sure the roots go down. Far. I'm just pretending like I know. And <laughs> if, if you guys have any comments on my planting skills or our arrangement skills, uh, use the comment section and uh, send in your critiques. Oh, man. The, the savages of YouTube. Okay. Okay, I dig it. I like that. That's gonna look. That's gonna. That's gonna look really, really. Yeah, if you really good. up on the side, that'll be yeah, awesome. I'll get that going. Okay, so then we have, we have this whole back section here, that we could easily put something with some sustenance back here in the corner. Okay. So, are there any plants on the table here, that are peeking out to you? Like, yeah, this. I dig this. That's gonna look great in the back. Well. I'm thinking maybe not the tallest one. Um, maybe the begonia. Is that what this is? That this is a colorful a, one. That is a begonia. Yes, sir. Good stuff. Because we can easily put that here, and then it will kind of couple here into the back. Yeah, I think it'd be it'd be a nice fit in the back corner there. Let's see planning skills part two. Oh boy. Here we go. I feel like this is intermediate now. So we want to knock all this dirt off. Um, I, I usually without uh, I usually take take off a good amount of it. I like to plant the bare root just to protect. Even though these plants have been, you know, nice and clean, it's just important to make sure that you take all precautions. That's perfect. I dig that. Okay. All right. So, and then feel free to move whatever substrate you want there around into the back, and let's see what we got. I think the official term is that you create a plant hole and then you put the plant in the plant hole and then you fill in your plant hole and you push down your plant hole. It's a lot of holes in one sentence. That's right. Wall Street Show. Yeah, those are my types of jokes. I love it. Yeah, I like that. So, and, and the expectation with this is this is gonna slowly grow and slowly take over and do its thing here. So what are we, we got this right here. So we got a, the hide that can go all over here. We got a hide that goes deep down here. And then we got a hide that goes deep down here. The deepest, darkest hide. That's where the yep. Dementors live. And that's this, <laughs> like the sign we have on the fridge. Okay, so now we have, we got two plants rocking and rolling. So now let's figure out, do we want to try to figure out the ghost wood pieces? Figure out how we want to put the ghost wood in there? Or do we want to try to put another plant? So I, I did grab one of these. Yeah. Just because their axles hold water. And I'm all you about plants probably. that hold water, especially for animals that get dehydrated quickly. So with the ghost wood, man, we got, we got a couple of sick pieces. So obviously we don't want them to be like up 
it has to be a pretty gradual, like almost like this. Kind of lateral. Yes, because that guy's climbing. What the heck is that? I'm not gonna climb. So if we go, let's see here. If I went like something like this, and then we have, and I can always move this up like that. So that way we don't, we can put a plant in the back. Yeah, we can still fit your, uh, your yeah. uh, tongue liquor looking plant in the back. Sorry, Christina. And then I miss, hey, if you don't like this, you say, no, Josh, this sucks. Let's try something different. Uh, like yeah. this is, this is how I do it. What do you think of that? Yeah, I mean, that's a lot of vertical space the animal's not gonna use. Fair. Okay. I'm thinking if you maybe take out this one piece. Okay. I like this and we can add the plant. Add the, the plant corner. and then maybe another cork flat. Maybe. If we, if we'll we have the space. We don't want it to be super crowded. Okay. See. I dig that. Let's, let's get a, do you want to get something here in the back or like we can but we can honestly we can put something here 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 you can even see the bugs crawling around honestly every place is open for us with the exception of our water bowl our water bowl spot so i'm thinking this this plant that you wanted to get in there we could fit it in that back corner all right all i mean right. as it's set up right now it would slip right in there yeah. really well yeah sound good slide right on in there <laughs> I, these are my favorite type of videos i really hope you guys enjoyed episode one of between the ferns with robin and i there's gonna be multiple uh, oh the, the fall the palms copyright infringement josh between the palms yeah great day it, it, it's been a great couple days all right so what we got rocking and rolling here is the is the spider plant is that and what this is mm -hmm. a spider plant mm -hmm. oh no no uh, i'm sorry a this, snake plant this is a snake this. plant they're called like snake plants for like short well, my grower, that's, like what, that's what my grower sells them to me. No, they don't. I thought it was like a tongue liquor thing. Cause it looks it like could also tongue? be called a tongue liquor. There's so, so many plants have so many different names for them. Like, it's I don't Common names. Yes. Common All right, names. if you know what this plant is, tell us in the comments. Yep. Okay. So I'm pretty sure it's not a snake plant. Sounds ridiculous. It is. I'm telling you. Tongue liquor. It sounds more. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like a perfect botany name. You don't know. <laughs> yeah, right. I don't. I'm just. I. I you know. Problem I, is, I, I just don't know provide either. dirt and dirt accessories with proper husbandry here. I like that. Yeah, get a little bit behind in the back there, like a little bit of extra soil. Yeah, that would be I'm gonna have to pull some out here. There we go. Move it around. I am digging this. Okay. So dirt and dirt accessories, that's a King of the Hill reference. Yeah, that's what, when people ask me what I do. And then we've done a couple office references. Yep. Um, so you guys so are learning my sense of humor real quick. Which is the superior show, Josh? Oh, The Office, hands down. Dude. That's true. Yeah, Michael Scott, you guys know in the uh, in the walkthrough, Michael Scott is all over the place here. That dude was a one of a kind. But you know he's inferior to David Brent from the BBC office. Yeah, I know. I saw that. It was all right. Okay. It's, it's exceptional. It's all right. Okay. 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 I like where this is going so far. I like this a lot. We got the leaves in the front. We got the plant in the back. So we got some other stuff rocking and rolling here. So we got layers and layers. Yep. We got a rattlesnake plant, a phytonia, a spaghetti, a uh, bird's nest fern, and a diffenbachia. Okay. You trying to go with one more plant in there? Oh yeah, I like them to be like dense. So yeah. here, so here's something we got. So this is gonna kind of take over right here on this side. Yeah. What if we put the rattlesnake plant right yeah. here, and then we put the phytonia? Nope. We put this bad boy right there, and then the water dish will go right there in the corner. Okay. Unless we don't want to do that. We could put, I don't want to cover up this hole. I like this hole because I got a plan for this over here. What do you think of that? Yay, nay, back away. It looks pretty good. Okay. Okay, let's see your potting skills. All right. You guys seen the bio dude plant many times. All right, let's see here. So I love these, these calatheas are one of my favorites. 
They're very easy to grow. They have pretty extensive root systems, as you can see, like they go down deep and they will go through your screen and into your drainage layer. So it's super important that when you plant these, that you are just taking that into account, that you're providing them enough of a depth layer for height and for uh, root space. And that's the rattlesnake plant. So. Yep, that's right, that's the rattlesnake okay. plant. That one, I believe. I can't wait to show you a picture of the snake plant when we're done. <laughs> all right, all right, all right. Um, oh, we also have the, the honestly, no, we, 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 we got a ton of color with the begonia. Do you want me to plant this too? Yeah. All right, all right. Look how good you are. God, this is only my career, so I would hope I'm pretty good at it. Let's see. Um, so, of all the species that you worked with, you mentioned Aki's yesterday. Yep, Aki so, monitors, favorite. Um, when it comes to geckos, let's nix out the monitors for a second. Okay. Of, of your geckos or your other lizard species like crocodile, skinks, besides the Aki's monitors, do you have another close favorite that you like to work with or that you like to see? Sure, so on, if you want a big lizard, I think the black throat is the very best choice. Nice. I love black throat I love, monitors. I love too. Uh, it's a big animal, you know, can reach five foot plus. Uh, but in my experience, lots of personality. They tame down really well, so they're good to interact and handle. Um, and they're super durable. I mean, they're like tanks. Yeah. Um, That's other than that, the Gila monster is also a favorite, which I noticed you don't have any Gila monsters. My workman's comp would being, not appreciate being that. Being Texas, it's got to be legal because everything's legal in Texas. Freedom. Um, but <laughs> healers are amazing uh, lizards to work with. And then on the gecko side, uh, Chinese cave geckos. Have you ever worked oh, with those? Oh, yes, I have. They're very, very cool. Super cool. They're red eyes, dude. Yeah. yeah. Really nice color, super yeah. spindly legs. Yep. Um, we also did those back in the Pro Exotics days uh, in the 90s when they first came in. And very, very cool species. And I'm excited to see more people working with those now. Yeah. I dig it. So, dude, with this moss, dude, I'm thinking about putting and some like up here. Dude. Yay, nay. Sure. We got some more. I mean, you know, play with it. See. The triple nose is going to like it for sure. We, we can put some on the ghost wood if you want. We can honestly put it wherever. So, you know. Uh Besides this species, we're going to be feeding, you know, this this little dude soft-bodied insects such as really small dubias that are going to be fed from a cup. You know, your crickets, uh, as well as, you know, like wax worms, butter worms, things like that, we'll be feeding him every two days until we get about a year old, which then we'll feed about once every three to four days, about eight, you know, eight to ten soft-bodied insects at that time. And of course, we're going to be dusting with all, you know, your proper supplements and things like that. Uh, which I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about here. And then we got that one. We don't have to use that other piece. We can keep rocking and rolling if you... You know what, if, if we break off a little bit of it and maybe fill in this gap right here, the, you know, the little dude can still get in yep. and out. Yeah, and obviously uh, this provides a barrier to the front too. Yeah. There's so many little niches and holes for him to get into. I like that a lot. Yeah, it's Simple, cool. open, but perfect for terrestrial species that is gonna live on, on the ground. Now, there is a little bit of a different school of thought here is, and that's about the, that's in regards to if UVB is necessary for the species. So being that they are super super secret and they, they are only out really during dusk and dawn. Mm -hmm. um, so there is a school of thought that they are absorbed. They are, you know, exposed to UVB. And we all know that when reptiles are exposed to UVB, they do, utilize it they do benefit it regardless mm -hmm. of what type of animal it is so with him we are going to be providing him a seven percent arcadia shade dweller that is specifically made for the for your you know your dust to dawn species like leopard geckos and african fat tail geckos and crocodile skinks is yet another great example so it's not um, a super duper blast yeah no it's, it's, it's a little bit lighter percentage and yep. a little bit mellower yep but they can still take advantage of the UVB benefit. Exactly, exactly. And that's something that we're gonna be have on with the Glow and Grow LED. So we're gonna have this on for about 10 hours to 12 hours a day, with this being on to 10, 10 to 12 hours a day, so that way we have a proper photo period. Now, in, in your experience, so some of my reptiles that love the humidity, after we missed 
heavily they just come out and they just lose sure. their minds. Have they, now, have you noticed that when you were keeping crocodile skinks in the 90s that after a heavy mist they would just naturally want to come out and explore or did it not really matter for you for you know when you missed it that it was kind of one of those things that we just came out when we wanted just to come out that was more of my experience they were, yep. they were pretty secretive so there's not necessarily a trigger that brings them out automatically okay of course the the better setup you can do the more comfort and low stress environment yep. you can create then i think you increase your likelihood of interaction and seeing them more frequently okay. with any of those secretive species nice you know okay. if you that do a poor sense. job of setting them up then they're always going to be in a state of stress yep. and always worried about predation and danger yep. and issues or just this setup sucks yep and that's and the wild so, animals so, so you, you, yeah, got, you, you take, take that away take that into yeah. account. if you take that away and provide a really great setup you're going to get a more confident lower stressed animal that, that you're going sense. to be able to see more often i like that so Here's, here's what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be covering up 50% of this screen with the with the plastic that I was telling you guys about. And then I'm going to be monitoring the temperature with my thermometer hygrometer. So I'm going to be making sure that my temps are between 72 and they don't go any higher than 81 on the hottest end of the cage. But the humidity is going to be maintaining around 70% consistently. And we're going to be having a spike once to twice a day that's going to reach that 90%. Now, if we were like keeping like dark frogs or something like that, that we want to get the 100% humidity, that's when I'd cover up the entire glass. Sure. You know, but like any other humid species that are, they are lizards, what are some of the things that we really have to be careful with, with them, when it comes with that? And obviously having a healthy soil is going to be a big part of that. But, you know, we, we, uh, we know that there's lack of airflow. These guys can be really susceptible to, you know, to fungal infections, upper respiratory infections because of how wet their, their biome is mm -hmm. um, you know in your course of keeping them is that something that you ever ran into or any other sure. issues that you would run into that my viewers should be aware, well aware of that's one of the challenges of doing a moist or really heavily moist Set setup Set is you have to balance your air exchange yep. uh, and the freshness of it so essentially so you don't create a sewer yep. uh, which is going to be poison for yep. the animal that's living in there so it can be a delicate balance uh, but it is important that you keep uh, uh, fresh airflow. Um, but you're gonna have to. We're gonna have to restrict it so we don't. What we don't want is to blast all the humidity right out the screen 100% yep. of the time. Yep. No. And then and then we're gonna have you know respiration. Even then, if it's too dry, then you're running into respiration issues, uh, shedding. Especially issues. with this this species. Yep. Yeah. Yep. Um, sure. Now another thing that I want to bring to to your guys' attention. So you don't really see this as often with you know your with honestly with your skinks it's more along the lines of your toad geckos but it can happen that when these little dudes if you're not keeping your husbandry right you see their cute little toes here pretty dainty yeah pretty dainty so if you're not properly keeping that humidity up you can get you know they can get their shed stuck on their toes and, yeah you can start yep, losing toes and they can start losing toes so that's yet again another really important reason why that we want to keep up with that Dude, do you want to do the honors of putting this little dude in here? Sure. Now, uh, my question is, Josh, do you name your animals? A lot of times, yeah. So, I mean... Really? Yeah, so, I mean, Smithers. You know, everyone knows about Smithers. I have Hercules, the Beardy. Um, some of my groups of frogs and stuff I haven't really messed with as far as giving them names. I'm, uh, I'm a non-naming guy. Um, but, like, if I'm going to get, you know, a, a lizard that's super personable, I always, I always name them. Um, mm. That's always how I've been since I was a little kid. Hey, dude. I know. Oh, there there we go. The skittishness. So, I'm going to uh, grab the pump, and I'm just going to give this enclosure a light misting. Um, and maybe see how he reacts to a little bit of the misting. Now this dude is here at the Bioduke Houston and he's gonna be here for a while. So if you guys ever wanna come and see him. He's here. All right, where did he go? He's right here in front of the water bowl. There you go, dude. Oh no. Let me see you here. Go. Go. He's like, I don't want to. I don't want to. I think he's going to be so stoked in this setup. Yeah, and what's nice, you see how the leaves stack like yep. this? Honestly, initially, that's where we're probably going to continually find him, is in the leaf litter. 
until he's going to be comfortable enough to go through this entire ecosystem and learn what bugs are in here. Are there any predators here? Right. You know, do I have to be concerned about that? So, you know, guys, that's something that you should always be well aware of. When you put your critter in an entirely new setup, regardless of how healthy they are or what, or, you know, whatever your experience is, you're always going to run into those, it, not necessarily those issues, but there's going to be an establishment period regardless of mm -hmm. what type of husbandry that you're that you're providing bad husbandry that 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 period is just going to end in death but you know if you're as long as you're keeping up with them the right way you should be okay i can't get over this little dude this is so we want to give him time to acclimate that's right time to settle in yep we're not gonna yank him out of here twice nope. a day nope we're I'm... not gonna poke at him yep we're gonna leave him be I just have him, us, you know, have him on the camera so that way our viewers can get a really good look at him. But, you know, when another thing, you know, you just want to make sure that you are keeping a count of how many crickets you're putting in there and how many are over. Or if you, you know, since you're keeping a bioactive setup, it's going to be hard to see if they're defecating in X, Y, and Z because that's going to be yeah. taken up. So it's just important to really, you know, pay attention to your little critter and know you know what it is that we're gonna want so what i'm gonna do is i'm actually just gonna pick up this leaf and i'm gonna put him right here there you go and i'm gonna put his water dish here do you want to give him a nice little misting for me and then we Oh man, I, it, I, like this brings back serious nostalgia because I, what's interesting is, you know, if you breed these guys, you can keep them, you can keep the eggs in the enclosure. Like just let the eggs sure. sit in the enclosure and you'll come in, go to the tank in the morning and there'll be, um, there'll be baby croc skinks in there, which is pretty awesome. Have you ever noticed males fighting? If, Kat, if you're keeping, you know, a trio and you have two males and a female in a large enough enclosure, have you ever noticed fighting or anything like that? Or is that not something? I would, that... I would expect. I, okay. I mean, I, when I'm, that was my... when I'm doing lizards, I'm, I'm never trying to have multiple males. Yeah. That, that typically makes sense. you're always going to be competitive. Uh, yep. Yep. Wow. Talk about a great little dude. So Robin, what do you think about this build, man? That's pretty rad. Yeah. I it, think we, we chose a really cool species to yeah. uh, work with. When you said it, I was like, that's it. I, and, you know, my viewers, you know, I know a lot of you have been asking asking for this setup. Um, and you guys know I sell the kit on my website, thebiodude.com. And if you're not sure how it works, just email us, customercare at thebiodude.com. We, we can get you all taken care of. Robin, is there anything else that you want to drop about this species before we log off? It's a cool species. Yep. Again, it's, it's not widely represented in the hobby, mm -hmm. but there are people that are captive breeding them now, yep. so you do find them available. Um, I would say it's not a beginner animal. It's a it's a bit trickier. Okay. So once you have some uh, time under your belt doing some different lizards or different geckos, especially a moisture type of species, this would then maybe make a great choice. But if, uh, if somebody's just getting into the hobby, sees your cool video and your cool setup, and says, I want to get a red-eyed croc skink, I would think maybe not yet. Yeah. Get some time and experience in keeping a habitat like this, yep. keeping some simpler species, yep. and then step into this as a, maybe a more intermediate uh, step. Yeah, I mean, you know, a, a great beginner species, like it's a completely different species, but if you can keep poison dart frogs as, as pets, then you can keep a crocodile skin. Yeah. Because they're, mm -hmm. now their husbandry isn't, it isn't, the same, but there are some familiar, familiar tendons, familiar things between the two that, you know, requires practice and dedication and research. So awesome. Well, dude, I had a great time building. I had a lot of fun. Congratulations. Nice job. Guys, come to my store, the Bayou Houston, Monday through Friday, 9 a.m. to 4 p.m. Make sure you subscribe to me on YouTube, Instagram, Facebook, Saturdays, 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. Thank you for seeing that. And Make sure you visit Robin's awesome, awesome platforms. Check it out at thereptilereport.com, Reptile Report on Facebook. And I mean, at this point, I'm ready for feats of strength. Let's go. The dude abides.